Well, hello, everybody. You might be opening your Bibles, if you will, to the 23rd chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 23, and in just a couple of moments, we're going to look at verses 13 through 19. Luke chapter 23, verses 13 through 19. But before we look at that passage, I'd like to invite you to pray the prayer that we're praying each week as we begin the message of grace. Dear God of all grace, please grant us the grace to receive your grace and grant us the grace to live it. In Jesus' name, amen. The jail cell of Barabbas uh, contained one window, and this window was about the size of a face. Barabbas knew the size of it because he had placed his face within the window and looked out. He had looked out long enough to see the hill in the distance and the three crosses on the top of the hill. One one look was enough. For he, he then turned around and put his back against the wall, and he slid down and he sat on the dusty floor of the jail. He hasn't moved since. He hasn't spoken since, which is odd because Barabbas is a man of many words. When the Roman soldiers came and led him out of the barracks toward the death row, he shouted barbs at them and he cursed their Caesar. He swore that he would be free by noon. But ever since he's been in the jail cell, he hasn't spoken a word. No one to speak to, for one thing. He's all alone. Nothing to say for another. He knows what awaits him. torturous death on a cross. He'll be crucified by noon. He'll be dead by sundown. So what's there to say? He knows what's coming. At at least he thinks he does. But we know better. We know better. We know what's happening about a hundred yards away from his jail cell In the fortress called Antonia, under the arched entryways, a covey of men have gathered, religious leaders mostly, bearded, garbed, religious leaders, tired, angry men. And above them on a step stands two men, the first, the Roman governor, Pilate, the second, a bedraggled carpenter from Galilee by the name of Jesus. Pilate, the first, looks toward Jesus, the second, and then looks back out at the crowd and he says these words. You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence. And have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod. For he has sent him back to us. As you can see he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore I will punish him and release him. But the whole crowd shouted. Away with this man. Release who? Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. It's about all we know about Barabbas, that he was an insurrectionist. He uh, planned against the law of his day, and he was a murderer. He had blood on his hands. If he had his way, there would be no Romans in Israel. And he was determined... To dedicate, devote his life to banishing and bloodying every Roman. Now, was Pilate really supposed to release, Pilate, a Roman governor, was he really supposed to release a man like that, an enemy of the state, back into circulation? Moreover, was he supposed to then crucify Jesus? 
Je Pilate had no party with Jesus. He didn't have any allegiance to him. He didn't have any affection for him. He didn't have any loyalty towards Jesus. He had nothing to gain by freeing Jesus. If, if Jesus has done something wrong, punish him. But herein lied the problem, or herein lay the problem. There was nothing wrong in Jesus. I mean, Pilate examined Christ and could find nothing wrong with him. Pilate, the equivalent to the CIA of his day, examined the life of Jesus Christ and could find nothing wrong. Nothing. He might deserve a lashing. He might deserve a lecture. But he didn't deserve crucifixion. Pilate eventually made this declaration. I find no fault in him at all. Now that is an astounding thing to say about a human being. I find no fault in him at all. Has anybody ever said that about you? I find no fault in him at all. With these words, Pilate, he doesn't know it, but he becomes a theologian. And he states first what will become a basic tenet or doctrine of the Christian faith. He states first what Paul will later state and what John will later state in their epistles. Paul would say, Jesus knew no sin. And John, in him is no sin. The sinlessness of Jesus. Of equal ranking with the dead raising, with the crowd feeding, with the water walking, with the leper healing, is this statement, equally miraculous, that Jesus never sinned. It's not that he could not sin. American history, as much as he loved offensive formations. And he would state at the outset of the semester, the purpose of the class. He was very, very clear. In essence, he said, from the moment the bell rings to the moment the second bell rings, you belong to me. And we will study and learn from the mistakes and the achievements of our nation, American history. Very clear in the purpose of the class. If only I had agreed with him in the purpose of the class. I had a different purpose. I had a conflicting priority, as did about half a dozen of us. We thought the purpose of the class was to have fun. We thought the purpose of the class was to take naps. We thought the purpose of the class was to throw spit wads. We thought the purpose of the glass, class was to pass notes or flirt with girls. We thought the purpose of the class was something other than the coach had stated. So we had conflicting priorities within the same environment. Here's how the coach responded. Whenever there was misbehavior in his class, he did something that we could not see. Looking back, I think I now know what he was doing. He was making marks in his book. We knew that he had a black book that he kept on his desk, a black spiral notebook, kind of a vinyl-covered book. It looked like an attendance book. I, I guess nowadays, in the era of computers, those don't exist. But they did back in the Neanderthal days. <laughs> he had, in that black book, all of our names. And that black book contained not just our names, but our grades, our attendance, as well as some marks about our discipline and our behavior. So somewhere in that book was my name, Max. And my hunch is if we could uncover that book, wherever it is now, that it has marks out to the side where Max misbehaved, Max talked, Max cut up. Max wasn't listening, Max was sleeping, Max was throwing spitwads, Max was flirting with girls. Over and over and over again. And at the end of the semester, rather than make a big deal out of it during the class, this coach just calculated these marks into the final grade. 
Your groan is very appropriate. <laughs> so I was thinking about this coach this week. And I was thinking, what if God kept such a book? What if God kept such a book? I'm not saying that he owns a black vinyl spiral notebook, but I'm not saying he doesn't. But what if, what if every time we used his class for our purpose, he made a mark. He has stated the purpose of this class, if you will, this life, this time on earth. He has stated it more than once. One of the clearest statements is in Ephesians chapter 1. That God's secret plan has now been revealed to us. It is a plan centered on Christ. Designed long ago according to his good pleasure. At the right time he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything. In heaven and earth. God's purpose was that we who were the first to trust in Christ should praise our glorious God. There it is. The first bell has rung. And until the second bell rings, God's plan is to prepare for himself a people. A people who will be prepared to inherit a redeemed earth and universe in redeemed bodies. And will serve with him and serve him in a one king kingdom. A one king kingdom. And that one king kingdom will serve as a wonderful fellowship for all who accept that invitation and agree to that purpose now. Unfortunately, none of us agree with that purpose all the time. Some of us, all of us, are guilty of insurrection, that we claim this classroom for our own purposes. I mean, to, 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 to look at the way we behave sometimes, we think the whole world is just about us. And that there's nothing going to happen after this earth. And so the question surfaces, is he noticing this? Does God note this? Does he make note of our insurrections? Does he make note of our acts of rebellion? Having stated to me, Max, what the purpose of my life is, when I use my life to advance my cause and not his, does he make note? Max exaggerates the truth for personal promotion. Max manipulates a conversation so it comes back to him. And Max boasts about personal accomplishments instead of godly accomplishments. And Max looks twice where he's never supposed to look once. Max uses gifts that God has given him for personal advancement instead of God's advancement. And on and on and on and on. This is just the last five minutes. Does God notice? I really can't think of a more important question. I mean, I'm hard pressed to think of a more important question. How does your page look? If there is a page with your name and there is a mark for every time that you have rebelled against God's purpose, how, how does your page look? The trend right now in the culture in which we live is to say, well, God's not looking. If God is there at all, he's not looking. That's the trend right now. That's why that sounds odd, what I'm saying to you. Because if you were to tune into an afternoon television show or an advice column, the idea popular is that God has taken the role of a sweet old grandpappy. And he's nice, and he's getting tired, and he's getting old. He doesn't really notice all the things that we do. That's, that's kind of the, that, 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 that's the company line right now in our culture. And it sounds nice. You know, oh yeah, okay, God is someday going to look at all of our sin and our rebellion and say, well, boys will be boys. That just happens. We're just going to sweep it all under the rug. We're just going to pretend it's not going to, that it never happened. We'll just, you know... And that does sound sweet, doesn't it? It really does. But to reach that conclusion, you have to take some scissors to your Bible and really cut out some prominent passages. And not, not only that, you have to create in your mind a God who has not within him the characteristic called justice. 
Because a just God must acknowledge and punish rebellion. Must he not? I mean, there is within us a desire to punish insurrection. How much more would that be within a God who is holy? When you look in Scripture for God's response to our insurrection, you find some very eye-opening passages just like this one. That each of us will give an account of himself to God. Each of us. So much for blending in the crowd. <laughs> and so much for riding the coattails of the church or my father. But each of us. Each of us will give an account. Each of us will give a rendering. Each of us. Isn't that the teaching of Revelation 12 and 20 and verse 12? The dead were judged by what they had done. Which was written in the books. Far be it from me to say the book is black vinyl like a teacher's notebook. But I do know we will answer for what is written in the books. You will look at your page and I will look at mine. And we will stand before God and we'll look at the marks and God will await an explanation. Each of us will give an account before God. What will you say? I know I wanted to say to the coach in the American history class, I wanted to say, sir, do you own an eraser? Is there some way you could just erase all of these marks? Is there some way you could just pretend I never did them? But he would not because he was a man of character. And he had stated at the outset the purpose of the class. And he could not erase those marks without going back on his pledge. Neither can God. Neither can God without lowering his standard. Is that what we want God to do? To lower his standard? And, and is that the kind of eternal kingdom we want to be a part of? That we want to inherit? A place where standards have been lowered? Where sin has been dismissed? Where evil has been swept under the rug? Isn't that the reason we're in the mess we are right now? Because we have called bad good and good bad and because we have kept secrets, family secrets, personal secrets, so they could not be brought out into the light and dealt with beneath the light, the cleansing light of God's grace. Listen, the kingdom of heaven will be a place marked by integrity. No secrets. And anyone who is in the kingdom of heaven will be there because their sins have been acknowledged and punished. Sufficiently dealt with. And the standard of God will not have been lowered, but the standard of God will have been satisfied, will have been recognized. God says the wrath of God is being revealed against all godlessness and wickedness. Well, where does that leave us? If God is going to punish sin, and we admit that our page has more marks on it than we can count, then where does that leave us? I believe that leaves us looking long and hard at the story of Barabbas. Because you see, we like Barabbas deserve to die. We like Barabbas are guilty of insurrection and rebellion against the king. We like Barabbas have hurt people. And have ignored the laws not of Caesar but of God. We like Barabbas have found ourselves in a jail cell. A jail cell of, of guilt. A jail cell of fear. A jail cell of anger. We have found ourselves isolated. We have lowered ourselves down to the floor. And we're waiting the footsteps of the executioner. And we hear him come. One step after another. And as the jail door opens, we don't even lift our heads because we know what he's going to say. We know what we deserve. We know what he's going to do. But then he says something that you and I never imagined that he would say. And we hear what Barabbas heard. You're free to go. 
Jesus took your place. They're punishing Jesus instead of you. Next thing you know, we're standing outside of the jail cell looking up into the morning sun, scratching our heads, blinking our eyes, saying, what just happened? Grace happened. Grace happened. That God, in his gracious kindness, declares us not guilty. And he has done this through Christ Jesus who has freed us by taking away our sins. For God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. And we are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood sacrificing his life for us. Yes, it's the greatest paragraph in the Bible. Look who took the initiative. God did. God sent Jesus. God triggered the plan of salvation. God created the plan of substitution. He saw our rebellion and sent his son to satisfy his anger toward our rebellion. He made provision for us. In fact, he made provision before us, before he even made us. And not just us. He made provision before he made Adam and Eve. In some mysterious way, he paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him for this purpose long before the world began. But now in these final days, he was sent to the earth for all to see. And he did this for you. Before there was a sinner, there was a Savior. Before there was a sinner, there was a Savior. Before there was a disease, there was a remedy. Before there was a Barabbas who needed a substitute, there was a substitute provided for Barabbas. And that substitute was Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do? Here's what he did. He took away our sins. He took away our sins. He didn't sweep them under the rug. He didn't pretend that we had never sinned. No, just the opposite. He made a public display of our sins by taking our sins to the cross where Jesus received not just the nails of the Romans and the spear of the soldier and the mockery of the people, but he received the punishment, the anger of God. The wrath of God was poured out upon his son so that it would never be poured out upon his children. He took your name, cluttered as it was with marks, and he removed your name. And he wrote his name instead. And if he had only done that, we could call that grace. But since he has promised to give us grace upon grace... He then turned the page to the one page in the book which bore no marks whatsoever. And do you know what he did? He marked through that name and he wrote yours. Astounding. Astounding. This means that if you are in Christ, when heaven sees you, heaven sees Jesus. Heaven heaven sees you and thinks, oh, that's Jesus. Because you have been credited, you have received in your account, you you have received the perfect life of Christ that you did not lead. And Jesus received the rebellious lives 
that you and I have led. Now we know what to say on the day of judgment. Now we know that he's not going to pretend that we've never sinned. Now we know that we will each have to give an account on that day for our lives. But now we know what to say. At least I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to quote Romans 6 and verse 23. If I can get my wits about me. I'm going to say the wages of sin is death. And I'm going to agree. Yes God. I deserve death. The wages of sin is death. But. The free gift of God. The free gift of God. Is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I'm going to say, Lord, count me among the gifted. Because of Christ Jesus our Lord. Because God made him who had no sin to be sin. For who? For us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God's plan, remember, is to create a righteous, a right people. How can he do this? He can do this by rightly punishing our sins. By punishing the only sinless one who ever lived. Oh, sweet exchange. That he became what we were so that we can become who he is. I do not know whatever happened to Barabbas. The Bible just doesn't tell us. I don't know. I don't know what he did. I don't know how he responded when the executioner came and told him that they're killing Jesus in your place. I don't know. You know, maybe he was an old pride-filled, hard-hearted man. So pride-filled that he said, ha! I don't need anybody to die for me. Stupid, foolish pride. But never is pride so stupid as when it keeps us from the gift of God. I don't know if that's what Barabbas did. Maybe he was just the opposite. Maybe he was so shame-filled. Maybe he was so shame-filled that he cowered in the corner, ashamed of the life he had led, and he said, oh, I'm not good enough to have somebody take my place. Yeah, he's right. None of us are. But how foolish to cower in our shame when we could stand instead in front of the gift of God. But I don't know what Barabbas did. But I know what I want us to do. I want us to be the Barabbas that stands up in the jail cell. I want us to be the Barabbas that steps out into the morning sunshine. I want us to be the Barabbas that spots the Jesus who's carrying the cross that had our name. And follow him as he takes the cross all the way to the top of the hill. I want us to walk in his bloodied footsteps. And I want us to be the first to stand on the hill of Calvary, I level with the pierced feet of the one who died in our place. And I want us to be among those who spend a lifetime saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.